from Music for All and presented by Yamaha. It's Mind the Gap, a practical web series for young and future music educators. Tonight's program, Teaching Beginning Band, Choir, and Orchestra in a Virtual World, hosted by Susan Smith and David Starnes. Please welcome Susan Smith and David Starnes. My name is Susan Smith, and I'm an educational consultant for Music for All and a lecturer in music education at Troy University in Troy, Alabama. I've taught at all levels and areas of music education, and I'm especially interested in supporting young teachers as my daughters are starting their second and fourth years as music educators. I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, David Starnes, to tell you about himself and about our webinar episode tonight. Thank you, Susan. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's episode. Um, you know, as a music ed music educator for 32 years and um, a music uh, education consultant for Music for All for the last 20 something years, um, we're at a place right now that I don't think a lot of us thought would ever be. And um, currently I am uh, the director of orchestras at Kennesaw Mountain High School and living every single day uh, what it is that we as educators are trying to make work uh, in a virtual world. Um, I come from a long lineage of music educators. My father was a lifelong music educator, and um, I feel very fortunate to have taught at all levels, elementary, middle, high school, collegiate level, in band, orchestra, and now uh, chorus, uh, doing some of that as well as far as some some help with uh, our, our program uh, at, the, at the high school level. So this is very pertinent tonight. And we developed this program tonight with the understanding that there is so much need for how you get students started um, at the beginning level when you can't be with them. And we know this is something that a lot of you have been asking for and we have phenomenal panelists for you tonight. I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague from Music for All, Mr. James Stevens, who's going to provide welcome for you and talk a little bit about uh, Music for All. James? Hey, thanks, David. Hello, uh, everybody. Good evening. Uh, just real quick, wanted to welcome you all and uh, just say on behalf of Music for All, our mission is to create, provide, and expand positively life-changing experiences through Music for All. Uh, we hope to be a catalyst to ensure that every child across America has access and opportunity to engage in active music making in his or her scholastic environment. Uh, I certainly want to thank our national presenting sponsor, uh, our, the wonderful people at the Yamaha Corporation. Yamaha supports music educators, and that is evidenced through their 25 years of commitment uh, to Music for All's programming. Uh, if you have not checked out the Yamaha Educator Suite, uh, I encourage you to do so. Uh, tonight, as uh, David and Susan mentioned, this is ep episode 13 of Mind the Gap. Uh, we have a semester uh, that is going to go all the way through May, and you can check out uh, upcoming episodes um, on our website. Uh, that's where you can uh, register uh, for future episodes and also watch past episodes. Uh, and it's my pleasure here this evening to, to share with you that just recently, uh, Mind the Gap has also uh, spun off into uh, audio podcasts. So you can find uh, the previous episodes starting to uh, release uh, on your favorite podcatcher uh, coming uh, to your uh, smart device and tablet near you. Uh, so check that out. So uh, thank you, David and uh, Susan. I'll turn it back over to you guys. Thank you, James. Um, well, I think our next um, I idea here is that we split off into three separate groups. Susan's going to be with the band folks. Um, I will be with the orchestra folks. Um, and James uh, will be moving uh, out with the choral folks. And um, at this point, um, Haley, are we good to go with that? Yeah, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and open all of the breakout rooms. And then it might take me a second to make sure that all of our guests here tonight are in the appropriate rooms. So if you could all bear with us for just a second and then um, it should pop up that you've been invited to a breakout room if you had, and you can go ahead over there and meet your panelists. All right, just a second, please. Logan's the guru here, uh, middle school uh, choir director in uh, Kansas, right? Yeah, I'm in Wichita, Kansas. Um, so I am at uh, Hadley Middle School. It is actually my first year there. So this has been a, a very, very odd first year. Um, you know, it does feel like kind of a first year of teaching and then some again. Um, but I teach sixth, seventh, eighth grade. And, uh, you know, Wichita is the biggest district in the state of Kansas. We're a pretty urban population. 
um, which has kind of caused for some challenges uh, with, with virtual teaching, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, but you know, it's a really great district, district to work for, um, a very diverse population of kids, which is really fun, especially in a musical sense, to be able to learn from them um, and connect with those kids as well. So we actually, um, I mean, I can get going, James, if you want me to. Yeah, I think just dive right in there. And if yeah. others join, we'll, uh, we'll catch them up, yeah. So um, I was kind of making some notes the other day of, of what I want to discuss and maybe some things that I've learned or, or um, experienced through this time. And the first thing I wrote down was I just returned last Monday. And like, that's the wildest thing in all of this is that, you know, we were kind of seeing some, some of our suburban districts um, and our neighboring districts bouncing back and going back into that hybrid mode. A few have been hybrid since August. Um, and my district has just gone back into a hybrid mode this last week, um, which has presented a lot of challenges. You know, there's still that virtual teaching happening alongside the hybrid. Um, I know right now with my rosters, it's kind of odd that every day, two thirds of my kids are at home. Um, that's been a really tough like mental shift because that's not what choir is. That's not what, you know, music is. It, it, it's a very colloquial thing, but we're all wanting to be there together, wanting to create together. And it's so, so hard with, you know, seeing boxes of a kid's initial or just seeing them warm up muted. It's so awkward, but you know what, that's, that's what we're at. So, um, you know, we, we've been out kind of nine months. Um, and so it's taken a long time to readjust for kids. And then as well as my teaching, it's, I'm still figuring out kind of what works and what is going to serve the kids best every day. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's really day to day, but just making sure that through all that I'm connecting with my kids and, and, you know, making music when we can, um, whether they're muted or not doing different activities there. Uh, Susan from Las Vegas. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, do you teach choir or I see a clarinet in the background? Uh, do you teach band orchestra and choir? All three. All Props three. You. Yeah. You're a hero. That's, that's awesome. It blows my mind. I'm always on the verge of <laughs> losing it. For sure. For sure. Um, and, you know, I, I talk to my colleagues as well that teach band orchestra. It's we're all kind of in the same boat. You know, we're, we're trying to stay afloat, um, but it's an inter interesting boat to be in in this time. So um, I know that just my big point that I kept trying to to write down in my notes were just to know what my kids need. Um, being in a new school, that's especially hard because I don't really know these kids, even if they're enrolled in my class. There's a lot of kids that when they walked in the door on last Monday, I was like, oh, hey, I, like I know you, never seen you, but I know you. And that, that's just kind of an odd thing that it's like, we've had relationships with these kids for so long, but at the same time, um, that virtual aspect, there's not that connection that's, that's possible within our actual classrooms. So that's been a great thing um, to finally get to see kids, hear them, hear them sing, hear them just talk, like forgetting how literally big and small middle school kids are. They were walking back in the building. I was like, Oh yeah, this is like, these are my people. These are my, these are my size of kids that I've missed for this long. And it's been such a shift. Um, but you know, virtual teaching is provides a lot of opportunities for me for growth in my teaching, as well as seeing what other things I've been missing out on teaching because in a quote unquote normal year, it, I want to sing as much as possible, right? Like we, that's what we do. We want to play instruments. We want to sing, we want to make music. And so sometimes we, we skip out on other activities or other projects that might connect with an individual that we're not really touching on because we're so focused on our normal year. Um, so this year's pretty, pretty great for throwing in those little nuggets of, of musical review, of review of terms, um, as well as some random, to me what seems random, musical um, items. I know that at the end of last year, one project that I did at the end of uh, this last semester, um, Spotify came out with like, they were like Spotify wrapped, which was kind of a summary of, you know, what you listen to and everything of the year, what genres, what artists. And, you know, when I, I saw it pull up on my phone, I was like, Ooh, I like that. Like it's visually appealing. It's clear cut. And I wanted my kids, like I, you know, we talk about what they listen to and things and their musical preferences aren't always what ours are as educators. And I get that. Um, but at the same time, I want to know what they're listening to. I, cause I can pull from that or I can learn from that. And, you know, kind of just to pull my kids of where they're at, because not every kid's going to love, you know, a random choral song on a Thursday night. No, they're, heavens no, they're not listening to that. So that was a fun project that we did. I kind of, you know, kind of stole the layout from Spotify and made it a PowerPoint and added it for kids. 
And that was a really great non-musical, non-singing activity that still allowed me to see the music my kids love and allowed us to talk about those things and express things. There were songs in there that I was like, okay, what, what is this? And a kid would tell me like, that literally just came out. And I was like, and that's what you listen to the most this year. And so it's kind of fun to open those conversations. And like, okay, I, I listened to it like 30 times in the last couple of days. Like, that's awesome. Um, so really getting to know the kids and knowing what they need throughout the year has been so huge. I go what ahead, about Jim. Logan? What I was just going to ask. So, like, what about um, especially at the age that you're teaching them? You know, the 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 compassion before content kind of thing in terms of especially when we're teaching, you know, remotely. Like, how do you, how have you uncovered, you know, the best practices there? I guess for sure. Yeah. Thank you. I I know that you know it's got to be about the heart. It's got to be about reaching the kids and getting to know them. Like I said, but a lot of times it's just simple questions. I mean, we, we've always done in our kind of layout for the day, we always do an attendance question one. So I literally know that they are there. If, especially if they're not a kid that doesn't throw their camera on, it's like, Hey, are you, are you alive over there? Like, let me just hear your voice so that I know you're, that you are a middle school kid. that's supposed to be in this call. Um, but you know, we do a lot of silly questions. Like I know that one I asked that we kind of got into a little feuds about in class was um, who would win in a fight between a grilled cheese and a pack of ramen noodles. First of all, nothing to do with music. Secondly, not even realistic. But there were kid, kids that usually don't answer on things. We're like, okay, so the ramen noodles would win because they could use the water to soak the grilled cheese. And I was like, yeah, it makes sense to me. Um, so just asking silly questions to get to know the kids and then just having discussions. I mean, the home life right now that we're expecting kids to learn in is is wild. I mean, we've I've got kids that at almost every day are like, hey, mister, I might not be super participating because... I'm babysitting. I get that. Right. Or, Hey, my dad needs to run errands real quick. I'm going to be on, on class in the phone call, but like, I'll be in the car. So I might not sing. And like, I get that. So it's a, been a lot of communication, a lot of reaching out to kids and seeing how they're doing. Um, just a daily check-in of like, how are you? And they're like, I'm fine. No, how are you? Like, how is this going? Cause there's some kids that are thriving in this virtual environment, but I think there's more kids that are, this is not for them. You know, they love to be on a screen watching TV or playing video games but sitting and doing math on a screen all day is really tough for them. I like your, uh, your kind of attendance question to kind of, you know, kind of two birds with one stone, make sure that they're there and, and kind of get something that gets going. Uh, are, what are other things are you doing to kind of, you know, motivate them or keep them interested? Uh, you kind of hit on that a little bit, I guess, but that's, I think the struggle that I'm hearing from a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, motivation's been tough. I mean, honestly, I'm not going to hide it. En engagement participation's been really tough. Um, again, just because of the situation we're in, but, um, you know, Kahoot is like, you know, the, 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 the OG, like that's everything kind of branched from Kahoot as far as games go. And my kids have really, they've enjoyed games. And yes, I've kind of known some music teaching in there, but it's like, okay, we're going to sing this. And last seven minutes of class, let's play a Blook It, which is like another kind of version of Kahoot. B-L-O-O-K-E-T. It's great. Um, it's got some different variations of Kahoot. And we've done some musical um, games. We've done some random Christmas song games. We've done some random knowledge games. And just a chance for kids to be kids and be silly and be goofy and not have to stress about everything that's happening or how different this situation of school is. Um, and then I also, I was like, how can I motivate kids? Because usually in, in, uh, a normal year, I'm a candy thrower. Like I'll buy a bag of Starbucks, Starburst. I'm like, here you go. Just don't eat them in class. But like, good job, good job. Or stickers. Middle school kids love stickers. This year I found like some meme stickers on, on Amazon. And I had kids like trying to fight over that. They're like, well, I got third place. I was like, yeah, sorry. He didn't win. So win next time and you'll get a sticker. So, you know, stickers are a, a silly motivator, but they work for middle school kids. Um, and then really the one that I've gone to this year that I've loved is we have quick trip here in the Midwest. Um, bless you quick trip, but they give out free drink coupons. And so you can go online, like request, you know, 200. And I'm like, okay, the winner of this game today gets a free drink. And then I mailed them out. And to me, it's worth the stamps to mail them out for a, you know, a 79 cent large drink. If a kid participates and you'll get some kids that they don't want to sing on camera maybe choir is not their thing, but they sure as heck will play a game to get a free drink. And those kids are really, they're just like killing it on the games because they, they want that silly little reward, but that's what connects with them. And so asking my kids at the beginning of the year, Hey, what motivates you? 
and some of them are like food really most of them are saying food um a couple of kids like money and i was like that's that's great same but like i can't really just hand you a dollar um walk up to your mailbox and hand you a dollar so finding what motivates your kids my kids love food and stickers and you know what i'm going to keep rolling with that as long as possible and until until they say otherwise like you know what i don't want the sticker we're going to keep going with that but stickers and sticker charts and the stickers are really just the way to go i think yeah well, no, and I see Susan's writing some some notes down because it's always like, you know, you get ideas from other folks. And, and you know, what I was going to say, Logan, is, you know, I remember hearing a seasoned teacher a long time ago tell me, you know, all the great ideas I've taken from other successful teachers. So just curious, like the ideas that you're sharing with us, how many, you know, have you got those, some of these from others or how do you, what, what is your, what is your, how are you assembling your bag of tricks, I guess? For sure. Like I, I think as you know, I, so I'm in my fourth year of teaching uh, this year. So I'm still in a sense, a young teacher. Um, but I, you know, I've learned so much in these, in these four years, especially with this year, but the, the best thing that happened to me when I entered our Wichita public schools is I immediately found a good, good, good group of incredibly talented, incredibly kind and incredibly giving teachers. And I'm so thankful for that because I don't know how successful I'd be without them right now. Um, but, you know, we've got a we've got a group text going that we talk about, hey, what is your schedule like or how are you guys handling these things? Because currently in our district, schools are handling things mostly the same. There's, you know, a few little adjustments here. But whether that is I have a 74 minute class and my friend down the street has a 60 minute class, you know, just comparing those notes. But it's, it's good to have people in your corner right now that kind of they're definitely in the same maybe sinking boat as you, but they feel your struggle. But at the same time, that group has been wonderful. And really, our whole district is great about sharing resources. Um, we've we've been fortunate that our curriculum coach in the, in the district has held over the past semester. Um, we started with once a month meetings and then kind of biweekly meetings. And it's really just say, hey, let's get together, talk about what you're doing. And some things are working for certain schools. And other schools have tried those things and they're like, no, that doesn't work for me. Um, but I, you know, I love making little resources and Google slides and just random things that I will send to as many people I can think of. And I'm like, Hey, if you want this great, if this doesn't apply to you, great. That's just don't tell me. So we've been great hey, was, sharing resources. No, I think that's great, Logan. And uh, Brittany, welcome. Uh, we're, we're talking some, some choir things and Logan sharing with us a little bit about, uh, uh, just motivation and where he gets some of his best ideas. I wanted to interject with just a kind of a quick question. Uh, and, and Susan, Brittany, Gary, uh, keep uh, the questions coming. And, and uh, Logan, if you're up to it, we could even, you know, if you guys are up for it, you know, even turn the mics on and, and ask a question that way too, if it, if it, if it, since we have a small kind of more sure. intimate group. But, uh, you know, as a young teacher, I, I think that that's sometimes uh, an advantage, especially with what we're dealing with right now. You know, a lot of folks have, I've been talking about how, um, you know, the student teachers and those that were like going through student teaching during the, the pandemic, how crazy that is to just go, oh my gosh, I'm going to go out there and, and what's going on. But, you know, there's some of these more seasoned teachers who are just like, you know, freaking out to the point that they're very set in their routine sometimes. And it's sometimes, I mean, just, you know, not to to, to be too uh, disruptive about it, but just the, the younger folks have a uh, have sometimes a, a, an outlook on on it, or or maybe more accustomed to technology or whatever it is. But um, I, I will tell you, without you know revealing the sources or whatever, there there have been a several folks who have left the profession who were exemplary teachers who had been there for a very very long time and just you know couldn't couldn't handle it so that's why Logan it's just really you know uh, cool to hear you talk about some of those things didn't know if you wanted to comment on any of that or Susan Brittany uh, Gary any questions related to those things yeah it's 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 really interesting um we've got a great kind of age range in our district as far as um you know brand new teachers to three four years and some tenure and then uh one of our high school directors he is set to retire this year you know he's He's been ready to go. Um, he is one though that I think is kind of the exemption to the more seasoned teachers kind of getting tired of this or maybe not adjusting to it well. I think that he has been reinvigorated by this because to him, this is a new challenge. And we, we were kind of all saying last year when COVID started, we were like, hey, you know, maybe maybe end on a high note, end on a normal, normal-ish year. And he's like, no, I can do it. And that's, I love that because he has taken this and ran with it. I mean, He's been the one that's like, hey, we did this flip grid and this is great. And boom, boom, boom. And he's got all these ideas. And it's like, 
I love that energy, especially as a teacher that knows he's kind of on his way out the door. Um, he's not just kind of sitting down and, and taking his time on the way out. He's really reinvigorating himself. Um, but also from the younger teacher end within my building and also with some other, you know, fellow teachers, it, uh, for music teachers, the younger teachers kind of become kind of the tech people, kind of the tech gurus to figure things out. Um, which I appreciate, you know, it, it's nice to have that. Um, but at the same time, I'm learning from those more seasoned teachers of things that they're coming up with that work better for their kids as well. Um, again, just a very diverse district, but we've got a good way of sharing information and excuse me, Coco, sorry. Um, and then uh, we share information really well. And then, you know, we kind of figure out this works for me, this works for me. Um, and it's not always the same. That's OK. Yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, middle school is, is just is an interesting uh, level. Uh, you know, we, we talk about with the social emotional learning piece, the number of, uh, you know, people who have had significant loss during during this, you know, um, and, and by that there's there's a lot of people who have lost loved ones. But also, in addition to that loss, there's there's um, you know, pivotal uh, events that have been canceled that have been really, uh, you know, hurt and, and, and uh, been a negative uh, affecting uh, the, the young people on just, you know, those, those, uh, those, those monumental things that they're looking forward to. So uh, it, there's just a lot of loss. So I don't know um, in terms of just the personal uh, approach, Logan, that uh, you've experienced or want to share in terms of just that kind of SEL approach, but just also that, um, you know, that we're there, there for each other during kind of these, uh, these crazy times. Yeah, the, we've, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, we've done a lot of discussing, and it's been discussing on musical side of things, but also just life of how are things in your home? Like, does, is anyone you know, affected by this super closely? And so that's good to talk to those kids, because some of those kids, you might be the only person that they can talk about these things. I mean, and, and we all know that as teachers, like we are a, a good kind of lifeline for kids a lot of the time, especially at a time like this. Um, I know that, you know, I changed positions during this time of COVID. And for that, it was kind of a, a break off, um, maybe more than I wanted to from my old school to my new school, as well as the teacher that was leaving my current school. Um, he, he did the same thing as I did kind of shared an announcement at that time we were using Google Classroom, kind of sent an email out to kids, I posted a video. I was like, you know, I've, I've loved working with you guys. I am moving to a different school this year. You know, let me know if you ever need anything. And that's not, you know, a super, it doesn't feel genuine as, as kind of a, as a end of the year for kids, um, especially because we come right before our spring break. I actually was at Music for All when COVID started kind of in the U.S. Um, and went home. And so I really didn't, I wasn't ready to say bye to my kids. Um, cause once I went to, to Indianapolis for music for all, I never came back to my school with kids in the building. So it was like a random Thursday. I left. I was like, Hey, I'll see you guys on Monday. And then we got three days till spring break. Bye. And I didn't see them again. And I was like, I'm leaving this school. And that was a really tough, it felt like a breakup with my kids. Cause I really love those kids as well as I know the teacher that I, I followed at my current school. He's like, I didn't get a clean cutoff with my kids. It was just, I posted videos like, I'm going to miss you guys. I love you guys. Bye. And, and so a lot of kids adjusted to that kind of poorly and understandably this year because they got back and like, wait, where is he? Wait, I know he left, but like, where'd he go? And I was like, he's good. He's at a different school. I'm in a different school, like things happen. And so for kids, that's an adjustment too for teachers is they didn't have some closure. Um, you know, our, especially middle school kids, even though they might not admit it, they love closure, they love procedure and they love consistency. And I think this time has rocked their world for consistency because you know, come back to school, even this week, it's like, it's a brand new school year. And then some, because it's so hard for kids, A, in the, at the end of January to come back into a school building, that's not normal, but B, to come back and, you know, even walking kids to lunch today, it was very odd because I was like, Hey, let's make sure we're spaced out, you know, try to keep six tiles between yourself. That's not what they're used to. They're always used to, Hey, get in line. Let's go catch up. Like we're always in a hustle to stay in line and get close. That's not normal. And so, you know, hearing kids at, in our lunchroom, and I'm, I appreciate how we're trying to take this this safe um, approach to everything. Um, but, you know, hearing one of my really sweet eighth grade girls go, this is just so different at lunch. Like that breaks my heart. And, and we, 
we talked about that when we got back to class. I was like, yep, yeah, absolutely it is. You know, and this isn't, none of this is normal. None of this feels normal. And that's okay because we can roll with that and we can learn from this opportunity. Well, I like how you mentioned that uh, earlier that uh, some teachers, some of your peers, some of your colleagues have been, you know, kind of uh, re uh, in you know, invigorated, you know, to, to be, uh, excited about not excited is not probably the word, but to just, you know, uh, there's a challenge and we're going to roll up our sleeves and we're going to make the most of it. And, and we're going to come out stronger and better on the other end. Um, there was somebody I was talking to on one of our other webinars who, who kind of, uh, mentioned, uh, and again, this is maybe more high school, but there's some middle schools that kind of do the, uh, the, the festival thing or some of the competitions or whatever, but it's just like, this has made me realize that I was, I was uh, approaching it all wrong. Like I, I, you know what I mean? Like the, the educator who, who basically just said, it's not about uh, getting the, the division rating or, 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 you know, you know, any of those kinds of things. And it, it's, it's about the kids. It's about the music. It's about the time. It's about how we structure our rehearsals. Uh, so there's, that's one thing that I kind of want to just uh, throw out there to see if you guys uh, wanted to chomp on that at all a little bit. But the other thing too is again, and every middle school structured differently too, but just the, uh, uh, the kind of the recruitment part, you know, has, has this disruption uh, negatively, in fact, uh, it, it impacted your current enrollment, Logan, or in, and in terms of recruitment and retention, how are you handling it going forward? Yeah, um, so kind of on both of those points, I'll go with the enrollment and then back to kind of the festival assessment, you know, time here. Um, my numbers really just took, took a shot because I, I was speaking with the previous director and asking him about their enrollment. He's like, man, you'll have classes like 50, 60, which on a rotation schedule for even sixth grade, like that's huge. And I was so excited for those. Um, and then when our kind of schedule came out for virtual and then especially with hybrid, those numbers were way down because um, how we kind of rolled out classes, we didn't give students too much of a choice on classes. They tried to keep some students that maybe had had that class last year. But at the same time, you had kids that didn't love to be in that class last year and got stuck in it for another year. Um, so that was tough, but yeah, my numbers have really taken a hit. I know currently with our, our virtual teaching, um, like for example, my eighth grade class, um, I have 30 enrolled right now. And on our first half of the alphabet days, I currently have four kids coming in person. And, the, and so I have 26 online those days. So that is tough A to get four middle school kids to sing together um, and not be very nervous about singing something and having anyone else hear you. And that's really tough to kind of build that culture of small group singing. But then on my later half of the alphabet days, I have 17 in person and 13 online. So that's, that balance is so hard to deal with. Cause it's like, those are totally different classes that I have to treat different. Um, you know, and, and I think with concerts and everything, like I'm still thinking about how I want to maybe do those this year. But, you know, with that, with that assessment piece and, and festival, uh, we went home right before our district common assessment, which is our, our choir festival for middle schools. And it was, it was very tough for some um, that really and maybe had that mindset of, okay, this is the thing we're working towards. This is our, our final end point. I was set on, you know what? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to do festival, but we're going to keep going. We still have another concert at the end of the year. We have our, our pops or our fun concert at the end of the year. So that wasn't necessarily a, a deadline target for me. And so when we went home and it's like, okay, no, no DCA, no assessment. I was like, ah, stinks. But like, you know what, we'll roll along with our lives. And I think this year has been a good shift for a lot of people that, yeah, maybe have had that mindset of it's not about festival. It's not about how many all state singers you have. It's not about these things. It's about having kids together, singing and enjoying life. Like that's really what it is. And, you know, I, my big thing is like, I, I want to help develop better humans and if we happen to sing alongside that, great. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things of like, I don't live for concerts because it's it's a learning process for kids and connecting with kids every day, not just at 7 p.m. on Thursday night where, where a concert is, you know. I love how you said that, Logan. And I think Brittany has a, has a comment here. Yeah, sorry for jumping in late. I no, just please. My, my group and um, my music teachers in my group. So I teach middle school as well. And I'm mostly a band and orchestra teacher. Those are my fortes. And then I started choir at my school, had experience being in church choir, did, you know, college, all that stuff. But um, it's not my strength 
So I love to get some feedback from you guys, but I've been virtual the whole time. And Gary said he's in Riverside. I'm in Ontario, California. So we're not far from each other. And I know my students have had a lot of issues trying to find a safe place to sing. And yeah. I'm, I'm curious about that. Like we did a winter concert, you know, we use Soundtrap this year. We're using e Easy Virtual Choir because that just came out and it's kind of awesome. So, um, but I, I'm, I'm having a really hard time with that class. My band and orchestra kids seem to have it figured out, but the choir kids, because they, they're not able to, blend and hear their peers and some of them live in like a house like with seven other siblings and they're they're trying to find places and i'm kind of running out of ideas of how to give them that support of what do we do you know we're, we're trying to make music we're trying to sing and then we're on zoom most of them have their cameras off several a couple have them on the you know the good sports and um and then you see that like cats are jumping on the laptop and siblings are, you know, trying to bother them, the little ones. And, and, and I'm, you know, I know it's February now. We're close to the end, at least in my district. We end May 20th. So um, I don't know how you guys are doing it with your schools. And I, I, I'd be really curious to hear how how that's working for you. Yeah, the, the safe space, the quiet space that it's been, it feels like impossible. Um, you know, I feel that. But it's, I, I've told my kids from day one, try to find a quiet space. I know it's not possible. Yeah, we've got kids babysitting. We've got cousins. We've got multiple kids in, in school that are all next, you know, and you hear a second grade class while this kid needs to answer. And that's so tough. And I've told them, hey, the closet under your bed, go, if your parents' car's outside, don't take it, but like, go sit there, go to the bathroom, but just don't use it. Like find, try to find anywhere. Um, you know, I had a girl sit outside a day that it was like snowing. And I was like, first of all, you are my hero girl. Like, that's awesome. But also like, stay safe. Um, you know, make sure you're warm. Um, my, my personal belief has kind of been like, if they can find a space and sing quietly, great. And if they can't, I get that because, you know, they're not at my house. And even, even days when I was teaching at home, trying to play piano, um, puppy here was not wanting to cooperate. And like, I, I can't blame the kids if life is happening around them because life is happening here too. Mine's just a little more chill. And, and so, yeah, it's been, it's been kind of like a try to find a safe space, a quiet space. And if they don't, I get it. I think the thing you mentioned with, you know, the, your instrumentalists that their, their musical voice is a bit more boisterous. Like think about a trumpet player versus a very beginning soprano. One is a lot more intimate and, and insecure of a voice a trumpet, if you're playing on the wrong note, that's okay. But you know what? Everyone's going to hear it in the household. Whereas if you're singing and someone walks in the room, you're, you kind of feel busted. And so I think that's so tough to get kids to sing. Um, you know, and I've, I've told my kids too, like, we're, we're going to do video recordings just because I want to hear you sing. It's not even always going to be to assess you. I just want to hear you sing. Um, an assignment I'm doing, because we our semester just started this last week. And so I have brand new kids. And so one of the silly assignments I'm doing is sing anything is the name of the assignment. And I just want them to record 35 seconds of them singing something. They can sing happy birthday to their dog. They could sing whatever new song. Like, I don't care. I just want to hear them sing. And I know already from first semester, I'm going to have little brothers and sisters in the background. I'm going to have a car. I'm going to have sirens, whatever it is. But to me, it's like, you know what? I just want to hear them sing whatever it is. Um, and you know that it, it's been tough to, to kind of try to skirt around that home environment, but yeah, man, I feel you, Brittany. It's, it's really tough to, to figure out how we can only hear those kids instead of hearing what else is happening around them. Well, and I was just noticing, uh, Gary had put a thing in the chat here about his, uh, about the high school students coming to meet with, uh, with the middle school students, I think to help with motivation, which obviously is going to, uh, impact, uh, hopefully, uh, recruitment retention, you know, to, to move on. Cause it's always, if, if, uh, you know, high school directors, I think will say that if, if the middle school can see them in the future in those roles, and they're like, yeah, I want to, I want to do this. I want to continue on. Um, so, you know, are you having these conversations maybe related to what you said, Brittany, and, and even Susan, in terms of the rehearsals that are ongoing now, but uh, the joy of singing, the joy of being a part of this and, and how that shows up now in a place where it is so frustrating, you know? 
Yeah. And I think, I think recruitment's really hard. Um, but Gary, I think that's a great idea. You know, I, I've, I've kind of discussed with my, my middle school kids, cause we're not able to spell schedule or anything to bring in the high school teacher to come, you know, visit class or to join us in class or bring in high school kids. I've, I love that idea. I wish it were possible in our district. Um, but, you know, mine just been like a, a very subtle mention of, hey, I know that the, the choir director at North High does this. Um, I know that she teaches like this, you know, kind of giving them some sort of prep of, hey, when you continue on in high school, hopefully you all do, like when you continue on, here's what, you know, I know she'll expect or here's what I know that she'll, a warm up she does in class. So trying to give them those little hints, um, you know, but recruitment's been tough, especially we're on a sixth grade rotation. Um, so every nine weeks, new kids, and they cannot stay for the whole year, unfortunately, in, in middle school, um, in my school. So sixth grade recruitment for me personally is really tough to get them to stay in seventh because if I have some absolute sweethearts that love choir first quarter and then they take PE and they take art and they take technology, you know what, selfishly, they might find something in that time that they love and by fourth quarter, they've forgotten about me. And so it's like, I want you back and you were great in class. So so I think right now the big thing with um you know, recruitment in my school has been just being present and obviously being full virtual. That's a lot harder. Um, but, you know, I think that anytime that our administration is like, hey, everyone, let's submit door decorations for a, a position or submit. Being participant in every one of those things gets my face out there a little more. So hopefully I can recruit some kids, even if I haven't seen them in person or actually heard them sing. Um, and right now, you know, I've got some sixth graders. We're we're back in person. So I had a girl today that she walked by to leave the building. I was like, see you guys, you know, see you tomorrow. And she goes, wait. And like, it's one of those things that she's never seen me in person until right now. And so it was that connection of, yes, you've seen me here, but it's like, oh, you're tall. And I was like, eh, well, thanks. But like, it's, <laughs> it's one of those weird things of like, yes, you've never met these kids. And so just being that, that presence as much as possible, even though they're out of my class so that maybe next year I can kind of keep them a little bit yeah, I uh, several things uh, to un unpack there. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, especially because Susan and Brittany, you both have mentioned the uh, the instrumental background that you both have too. That uh, sometimes I I found uh, just interested to hear what you guys have to say about it. That sometimes recruiting beginning choir, you know, next to the instrumental folks is, is a little sometimes peculiar because uh, you haven't played an instrument yet. You're starting an instrument and even a music for all, I was going to mention that we have a lot of, you know, free resources on our education site, uh, recruitment and retention. Um, a, a lot of them, you know, are, 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 are kind of earmarked, especially for, for instrumental because of what it is. What's interesting again about choirs, everybody has a voice and that that part makes it uh, makes it uh, uh, even kind of easier to, to 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 bring in. So I didn't know like, you know, that's that's the thing where I don't know if you guys struggle with that that point or or want to comment on that at all. For me, um, the the. Or elementary specialist leads really well into I'm in a K through eight school, actually. And so she leads really well into choir for the kids to come up to choir. So usually it's the other two that I'm fighting them for. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I was at this, uh, you know, I was privileged to be able to teach at several different states uh, before landing here at Music for All and um, small rural school, medium-sized school and, and humongous school. Uh, and the large school, I remember when we would do the recruiting thing uh, at the high school level, we, hit, we, were, we were tasked with having to do it all at the same time, orchestra, choir, and, and band all together. And it became like really kind of competitive, which sometimes was not um, what it's all about. You know what I mean? I think for me, well, I do everything. So I have, you know, beginning band, advanced band. The advanced band is also a marching band. So we do um, competitive marching band in Southern California. And then I have orchestra, advanced orchestra, and then my choir. And when we do sixth grade recruitment, because my school is only junior high, so it's only seven, eight. Um, when we do sixth grade recruitment, they come to our school and we do like a giant number. But since I've been there, I started the choir program uh, seven years ago now, 
And so it's on seventh year and from nothing. It used to be recorder or general music, I think, before that. Um, and we just do a giant production. One year, my choir wanted to do like a show choir kind of thing. And I'm like, yeah, sure, you know, let's go for it. <laughs> like, it, that's fine. And um, we've had um, some competition, but usually the, like, I, I'm fortunate that my, my school offers zero period and I get to have a lot of my kids two times. So my kids will be in choir and band or choir and orchestra or band and orchestra or dance or whatever. They'll do, they'll do both things. And um, I don't seem to have too much of an issue because the kids that really want to sing, they really want to be in choir. And, and I get all my little, you know, minions to go out there and like, you know, just get them all invested in it. I am worried about this next year though, because my elementary team, cause we're a K-8 district in Ontario, um, they are sharing that their numbers are really low, like their music numbers. Um, one of my teachers is teaching at eight different elementary schools and she's like, together I can pull in 15 to 20 kids out of eight schools, um, which is not usually how it is. So I am worried about next year and I'm trying to think of ways of what I can do, you know, to try to send something to the elementary schools to get them um, the word out about choir, about band, about a orchestra, you know, and, and I know we are coming back in the fall, might maybe hybrid, so um, might have to get used to what the heck that is and, <laughs> and how to teach that, but um, I don't have too much of an issue because I'm the teacher for all of them. If, if I, maybe if I had a, like a, a coworker that was teaching choir, then it'd be like, oh, yeah, we're like, you know. Yeah, you're not fighting with yourself, right, Brittany? <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, I think I think you brought up a good point about, you know, how do I reach the elementary schools? Um, in a normal year, it's easy to, you know, pop over after school and, you know, be with after school choir, whatever it is. But this year, um, you know, I think you mentioned earlier, Brittany, that you guys did a, a virtual Christmas concert. Um, you know, hopefully maybe you can put something together virtually. Um, to email out to all the elementary kids or email to the elementary principal, see if they can send it home with their families, you know, as, a, as an email. Um, so I think maybe, I guess, since not throwing you, be like, hey, this is what you should do. But just a, a thought, since you mentioned that you've done a virtual concert in a sense, you could maybe put something together to send home to them. And that's kind of something I've been thinking about is how do I do a virtual choir hype video? Like how do I do something since we don't have a con you know, concert footage this year? We don't have the worlds of fun trip that we usually do, you know, amusement park performance and trip. Like that's a big, that's a big recruitment tool for, I know my current school, which last year, since it didn't happen, that was tough because there wasn't, you know, there weren't kids coming back on Monday. Like, oh my gosh. So we wrote, blah, blah, we did all these things at the amusement park. And we also sang, and that's, that's really tough because the, the, our big events that maybe we've done in the past or our, our fundraisers, whatever it is, those aren't there. So I think kind of those, those choir videos have to kind of be the the way to go maybe this year. Um, and yeah, I've kind of, you know, it's tough to hear that your district is kind of struggling with those elementary numbers. Um, I've had maybe a little bit pessimistic thought of like, what if my numbers are super, super low like next year? And I think, you know, that kind of what rang in my head was like people nationwide saying, oh, these kids are gonna be behind. Behind to what? But, you know, yes, behind from a normal school year, behind from a normal choir performance. But I think this is an opportunity to kind of give teachers, um, even if they're small, a chance to kind of read how we how we do things, like James was saying earlier, to not maybe focus on our, our festival scores or or those things this year. This is a chance to kind of rebuild programs mentally more than anything and just see how how we do what we do and kind of self-assess and glance in at our, our own teaching and, and our own practice of, of how we're connecting with kids. Um, especially in the kind of this dark time in our nation. Yeah, you made me think of something, Logan, that I did want to share just because I thought it was a clever idea. Again, educator here who is looking at you all going, I have not taught a day in my life during a pandemic, so I can't tell you, you know, you guys are the experts. Um, but uh, it was interesting. A couple of weeks ago, there was an educator in Ohio who shared with me that she does these uh, open mic Zooms 
with her kids, which uh, showcase her students' primary and secondary talents. So it's not always about music, and it's sometimes they're just doing some quirky things, uh, which uh, the way she explained it, I mean, it, it's that gravitational pull. You, you sometimes hear people talk about a teacher being a kid magnet or whatever. Her her uh, her open mic zooms really seem to be something that the that the kids really uh, enjoy. Uh, they it, it's it's a community that they're latching onto. They want to you know they they thrive to be in that 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 place. So uh, I don't know something to something to maybe think about or, or take the idea and, and and embellish it on your own. Yeah, I, I like the open mic, and I know I kind of thought about personally um, back in the fall before numbers escalated and things of what our community performance venues that aren't traditional that I could go in. Like we have a somewhat abandoned train station that's in a park. Sounds very odd, but it is what it is. And like, how could I get kids socially distanced there to sing to parents or random community members that want to come? Um, so I think that's kind of a thing that going into the spring as, you know, California and Nevada, man, you guys all have good weather. I can't, I can't complain. Um, in Kansas, we, it's cold. Um, today was a great day. It was like 50. Wow. So, uh, you know, as the spring comes, I'm like, how can I go outside? How can we, how can we perform outside, you know, pending, um, you know, community guidelines and things, but how can we do more community events in this time? Because I think no matter if you are a musician or not, people still love hearing music in the community and seeing, you know, those events in the community. So how can we use our middle school or high school kids as kind of community performers during this time, not only for the community members, for our students to do things, and then, you know, kind of for us as, as um, recruitment and retention too, of giving them a non-traditional setting to do their thing in. And so maybe those open mic nights are, you know, in at a, a park or it's at, you know, somewhere outdoors where we can safely gather yet still share music. Yeah, I was going to say, again, I don't know where you all are now in terms of how uh, to perform, Logan, but I like your idea of a big enough space. Uh, some folks... Uh, and they're ahead of, you know, where you guys are maybe able to do some of these things or not. But like uh, uh, one of the schools in Texas, uh, they had their kids really spaced out and were able to perform for each other, for their peers. Like if there's more than one choir, um, but they did the, you know, live stream on Facebook or on YouTube or whatever, where the parents could watch it that way. And then it's on YouTube still, like I went to go check it out and you could see the chat, the parents that are getting excited by the, you know, the, the particular piece of music or whatever. So, but community engagement, uh, right on Logan. I mean, it's, you've got to be thinking about that. I, I think as a constant, like, how are you, you know, making uh your ensemble just really and what does community mean it's it's your school it's it's the the city whatever all those places uh making you know your ensembles and your kiddos um just sharing the success of what's happening in your classroom i think yeah and i you know you see the 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 front porch performances i've seen facebook that's even if it's just you know you so or if it's um, you know, an accompanist and one, one kid, we do kind of, we do solo and festival community. Like, how does that look? Uh, obviously I don't, I have not put anything in place yet, but, but like, these are things maybe could work out or maybe I could get connected with you know, city to, to have that park performance or have, have a middle school festival safely in, in a city park. I don't know. So, um, there's some things that maybe, as the spring comes, increase, you know, and seeing how can we get kids together and still perform and still have music, um, you know. And again, if your building would allow it, I'm I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that I can get um, kids here, you know, every fourth auditorium seat, and yeah, do a filmed concert. We can at least have something to share with parents. Well, and we don't have to stay right on the clock, but with about five minutes left, I wanted to, we didn't really get specifically to, to the rehearsal, though we're um, uh, alluding to it a little bit. What are, what are the, the, uh, the challenges, the obvious challenges, but what, what are maybe some of the uh, things that were coming to best practices to just get the rehearsal to happen? Yeah, I would say two things that really stick out to me. Number one is pacing is so different. Um, and that's been a hard adjustment because in the past, like, okay, let's get out this song. That took two seconds. 
versus now it's like, okay, let's click on here, click here, click here, go open your music. And with middle schoolers, I can't even imagine with elder schoolers how it's tough, how tough it is to find things online. Um, I mean, our district's using Microsoft Teams, which my personal goal with that has been, how do I reduce the number of clicks to get to something? I still not found the answer and we're nine months into this, but like getting out music is such a process and, and it's not as easy to write on your music versus a mouse pad trying to write in soul fetters. Like that's, that's so hard. So that's been a huge adjustment as far as pacing and writing and music and the actual music part. Um, the other thing I think has been tough is not tough. It's just a, a new challenge is what can we sing? If they are all at home and I cannot hear them, what do we do? Um, one resource that I've really loved that both has kind of this, this social justice aspect, but also just good, simple music, um, justicechoir.org um, has, has a, a, a song book. It's got like 35 songs. Um, they've got, again, a very big social justice theme, which I think is important too, to discuss with kids right now. Um, but they've got some just really easy one part, two part stuff in there, but also a lot of foreign you know, four piece chorale or four part chorales and some really beautiful music um, with some great arrangements in there. I know like um, Tespa has a few pieces in there and and they've got videos of each of those songs on YouTube kind of as a playlist too. So um, a good way for kids to see community singing. Obviously they're all filmed last year. Um, and then also just kind of get a glimpse at those. So Justice Choir is, is a good source for that. And I've taken a few of those is just simple singing, simple exercises. And, you know, I, I think this is the year to personally of like, I'm not going to maybe focus on that traditional concert lit. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at a, a Billie Eilish piece that's pretty simple. Um, piano part, I'm not a piano player by heart, and I wish I would have tried harder, but um, it's got a really easy accompaniment to it. And for the kids, it's just, it's super simple. It's something they know, but something we can kind of break down and still teach concepts through, but from a singing aspect, it's pretty simple. And so, um, my thing is this year, like just sing what we can in class, sing when we can in class. And then, you know, it's, it's not gonna be perfect. It's not gonna be pretty. We're going to have sound in the background. We're going to have sound in recordings. Um, and that's just kind of what it is. You know, the rehearsal, I'm trying to teach it kind of normally. I know that us returning to hybrid, they're encouraging us for attendance tracking purposes to have kids that are still in the building, log into their meetings and, Personally, I would love kids to be able to take a break from their computers for a second and just focus. Um, you know, I kind of ask my kids, like, do you guys want to be on a computer? So like, we don't mind. And you know what? They've grown up in that. So I get it. Um, but I know my thing is like, let's just not do much of computer things right now. Let's hold actual sheet music. I'll sanitize my hands and hand it out. Put it in your folders, you know, before the weekend. Like we're treating it all safely, but I kind of have been trying to, to treat it somewhat normally to get a 1% sense of normalcy. They have folders, they have sheet music to try to ease on back into normal so that maybe next year when things are better, um, our, our rehearsal can be back to normal and feel comfortable for those kids that were here during this time of hybrid. No, I think that's great. Uh, Brittany, you can ask a question or have a thought, yeah. I was just curious how the rest of you guys are structuring your, whether you're doing hybrid or doing virtual, how are you like if you gave us a snapshot of your your class how is it going like do they welcome in blah blah etc i'm just curious from you guys susan for me it depends um i try to do composers i like every other week where we choose a composer and focus on them um, I've done a lot of, um, with my choir, I've actually done band lab and they, they have discovered that they can sing and record themselves and really enjoy it. They, they put a backtrack to one of the songs they like, and I was super open, let them choose whatever they wanted. And, um, what was really fun was seeing who like went above and beyond. Um, I had a couple students who like partnered up with another person so that they could put two tracks, one of each other on. And another student who recorded th all three parts of a song, you know, and so, and that it's not, um, it's not video, so it's not as intimidating to them. However, I did have one student who recorded uh, this, this particular one was a, a flautist. 
she recorded three parts and then recorded a flip grid of herself with those parts. It was really cool. And so anyway, just like you said, sing when you can, sing what you can. That was great. That's exactly what we try to do. And some days we don't. <laughs> some days we visit. And that's that's huge. Some days we don't sing. I I feel that. I know that with our our new new schedule with going back to hybrid on Wednesdays we we have a full remote day, so every kid is home. And I've kind of already said, you know, maybe those aren't our singing days, and that's okay. Uh, we don't need to sing all day every day. Um, that's maybe our day. Like we're gonna do a, a project here starting tomorrow is for those kids that might not be love singing as much. Um, we're gonna do like a plan your own music festival. Um, so looking at different aspects of a music festival and what you need to do, what genres, what audience you want to go for. So finding those things and doing those little side projects. I know like our kind of daily layout has been, um, some vocabulary and, and bell work review, um, and just some review of the basics because not being in school for nine months, it's been really tough to review those basics and keep those things fresh, um, with solfege and rhythms and all these things. And, um, then we sing for a little bit and then maybe work on a little project or do a listening journal. Um, listening drills have been good for kids just to connect with new music, but also reflect on music that may not be for them. But, you know, even if it's not for you, explain why. Um, like today we listened to the Aeolians uh, piece from them. And, and it was cool to see kids really be like, oh, I, I didn't think I'd like it, but I did. And, and that's huge because traditional choral music might not be for them. But again, it's finding that, that music that they can get a glimpse into or finding music that they maybe connect with more. No, I think this conversation is great. Susan, yeah, you were going to chime in. Yeah, there's one more one more thing that I, uh, so I don't know if you know about flat.io. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I was 100% using it with my advanced band and orchestra and, and loving what they were discovering. And then, and I just kept putting off using it with choir because I was like, I don't know exactly. I mean, because the learning in choir is so diverse. Um, some of the kids know everything and some of them absolutely know nothing. <laughs> and so it's, um, but I finally introduced it a couple of weeks ago, just plain let them mess around on it the first time. And then, um, you know, there's a setting in there that you can put solfege in there as, as the note head. And, and they have enjoyed that. Um, so flat.io has also been uh obviously we don't sing so much on those days but they love to create it's been really fun to watch them create yeah and that's and that's a great you know those the flat.io and those different apps and devices that we're using are great for a hitting those different modalities of kids that maybe a traditional choir class isn't for them um it's great for those modalities but it's also great to get them to practice those non-singing things that in a normal year we might not hit on composition as much but this presents opportunities to do those things that creating standard. I know is sometimes maybe the hardest to hit um, in some years. And so now this is a chance like, Oh, we can really focus on that responding and creating standard. Um, whereas again, in a normal year, that's maybe not the priority, but now it's, it's new opportunities for us and for kids to find new things that they like or new projects they like or games they like and connect with through music. No, I think this conversation is great. I uh, just put here in the, the side chat here, uh, two of our websites, uh, you've probably seen them. Uh, the education dot is where our, our webinars and all these different things uh, kind of live, but there's uh, some recruitment things and other things. Um, the advocacy, uh, we use, you know, advocacy in action is a place where we d dive into recruitment and retention and community engagement and, and a lot of those things. Uh, and we typically annually have an awards program, but we're a little bit in hiatus with, with what's going on right now. So you'll see some of those that might not really resonate with you currently with what's going on but i always like just to hear from folks who peek in there and go you know what that is helpful because it got me to think of another thing so sometimes it's maybe not the copy paste example but uh you know it's uh, i'm i was always looking for places to beg borrow and steal so that's what and, and I've I've enjoyed just listening in to the conversation here, uh, Logan. Certainly appreciate uh, your uh, taking the lead and taking uh, your time out of your schedule to visit. Um, any any final thoughts from Logan or, or from uh, uh, Susan, Brittany, Gary? Uh, with the with the kind of the plugs for the Music for All resources, I would say that um, the choir.musicforall.org 
also has their quick tip videos. Um, I know Josh Petty in the Indianapolis Children's Choir has a lot of the videos on there, um, as well as some other resources. And those are great. You know, we're talking about beginning ensembles. Those are great for beginning ensembles and just some good kind of refreshers of, of maybe ideas or games or warmups. Um, like James just said, Bag Steel and Borrow, I think, has been the go to during this time of virtual teaching. It's I, I think that our, our workload is, has risen. Um, you know, normal lesson planning and breaking apart a piece of literature is easy in our book. Like that's what we do. And this is not it. And so I think um, finding those resources, sharing those resources are so great in this time. So um, thank you guys. I, you know, I appreciated talking to you all. And um, if I can help you with like any resources, my things aren't, aren't great, but they work. Um, so I'd be happy to you know, send whatever to you um, if you need to, or share resources or share ideas um, whenever. Uh, it's it's been great to connect. Uh, this means a lot to me to to hang out with uh, choral folks because it's it really is music for all. A lot of times, as a as an organization that kind of has a little bit of a uh, a band tilt, and 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 Susan and Brittany in particular, coming from an instrumental background, probably know what I speak of. But uh, this is it's been uh, inspiring for me. Uh, hopefully for you, it's more important for you. Um, but yeah, let's keep the conversation going. And uh, you know, my job at Music for All is just to 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 help be a, a resource. So again, thank you, Logan, so much. Thank you for joining us, Susan, Brittany, uh, Gary. Uh, everybody, uh, take care, stay well, and uh, best of luck with your uh, your students going forward.